when I put a poll up asking people what sort of topic they wanted me to cover uh, analyzing the opening of the Ukraine crisis, one was far and away the winner. Um, it was a question raised by people who were observing the picture after picture after picture of Russian tanks blasted to smithereens coupled with happy Ukrainians nursing their in-laws javelins and shoulder-fired missiles from across NATO. And they raised the question, the question which has been raised so many times um, throughout history, does this represent the end of the tank as we know it? The, the end of the role of the armoured beasts of the battlefield as the dominant weapon thereon? So, after dodging it and avoiding it and covering the less controversial topic of drones, here I am to do it. And I understand why people ask the question. Uh, Russian armour spent decades intimidating Western observers, although we should say Soviet armour there rather than Russian observers. For decades, the great um, deep-seated fear of Western analysts was hordes and hordes of Soviet tanks supported by helicopter gunships uh, and mechanised infantry rolling through the folder gap in Germany and across Western Europe in their BMPs and basically running to the Rhine in seven days. Um, it was a threat that was so great that in its early days, the best the West could come up with in terms of counter-thinking was the employment of nuclear weapons and massive retaliation, if you go back to the Eisenhower eras. Um, that thinking eventually evolved, but it goes to the heart of how scared most Western European powers were for so long of the Soviet armoured spearheads, the evolution of the Soviet armour of World War II. So, of course, when the Russo-Ukraine war started, and indeed even in the lead-up, again, I always bring up this graphic because I hate it so much, uh, you started seeing numbers like this floated around, uh, that Russia had 12,000 tanks uh, outnumbering the Ukrainians, something like 6 to 1, so surely... The Russian armor juggernaut was going to crush Ukraine like a bug. Um, one reason I hate that graphic, by the way, is uh, there's no like with like comparison. You compare the number of active ground force personnel and then you include the reserve tank numbers in the tanks, uh, which is a little disingenuous. I just did a really quick back of the envelope um, on the right there showing that if you talk about tanks that aren't rusting in storage, the numbers are much, much closer than the graphic on the left suggests. Most of that Russian armor, the 10, uh, 12,000 vehicles, is T-72As and older. Uh, rust, uh, not, we don't know they're rusting, but based on the condition of the tanks we've seen, they may well be rusting in storage. Uh, and a lot of the Ukrainian vehicles, the older T-64s, are likewise in reserve. So, the rest is recent history, right? Um, Russia drove its great armoured force into Ukraine, and we got picture after meme-tastic picture of tanks launched, uh, tank turrets launched and embedded after ammo carousel cook-offs. We saw uh, shipment after shipment of uh, anti-tank guided missiles and shoulder-fired ordnance arriving. Um, ATGM, when I say ATGM, I mean anti-tank guided missile, which is simply a missile designed to kill a tank which is guided makes sense. We saw these shipments arrive. We saw the tanks being destroyed. The Russian offensive uh, seems to have slowed or bogged down, and the losses, the visually confirmed losses of equipment, are spiking to levels that most Western armies would consider unacceptable or unsustainable. So surely this is the end of the story. So here's how I think most of the people who volunteered me, perhaps not valuing my life, uh, thought this topic was probably going to go. I was going to share some St. Javelin memes, which is the meme that's spread around the internet around how the Javelin missile or the end law are the patron saint and defender of Ukraine. I'd show you lots and lots and lots and lots of pictures of destroyed Russian tanks because we have lots of pictures of destroyed Russian tanks. We do some very obvious math in which I point out that tank more expensive than Javelin missile or and much more expensive than Enlaw or the unguided stuff that uh, some of the other European powers are sending. I tell you then, ipso facto, tank go to scrapyard uh, and the spreadsheet warriors and budget crew would win again. Uh, Robert McNamara would be proud. Then it would all go horribly wrong. Uh, the tank crew would come out and start making some points, some extremely valid, some less so, they'd point out quite rightly, I'm not a tanker, I'm not a manoeuvre element leader, I'm not military. Um, they'd point out that I'm an Australian observer, I come from a country with a mighty, mighty tank force. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure Russia has abandoned more tanks in Ukraine than the Australian army operates. They'd point out the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, war, where yes, the drones were the grim reapers of the old unsupported T-72s, but in the end of the, at the end of the day, the manoeuvre elements, the tanks, the mechanised infantry, were the ones that took the ground and arguably won the war. The drones won a lot of the spotlight, but you can't rule out the role of the manoeuvre elements supported by armour during that conflict. The argument would be that good tanks will be fine, uh, that yes, missiles are chewing up older, older model vehicles, 
Yes, they can destroy uh, unmodernized T-72s. Okay, maybe they can destroy modernized T-72s, but they won't destroy uh, T-14s. They won't destroy SEP V3 and 1A2s. They won't destroy the latest version of MBT. So good tanks will be fine. Um, and whenever you show pictures of good tanks being destroyed by ATGMs, uh, we might move the goalposts a little. Uh, the Leopards being used by Turkey, maybe they weren't actually good tanks, or maybe they were just being used really, really poorly. Um, and then finally, they'll raise the spectre of the 1957 UK Defence White Paper, which is where the UK uh, proudly declared that the invention of the surface-to-air missile meant that they didn't really need a fighter force anymore, um, which, based on the way warfare has evolved since then, probably turns out to be a bit of a a uh, bit of an oops decision in retrospect, especially since it basically KO'd um, large parts of the British and Canadian aerospace industry, uh, which would have been an asset in the Cold War going forward. And this would all culminate, presumably, with you all getting news of an unfortunate training accident where somewhere in Australia, um, a tank accidentally ran over a civilian vehicle, then accidentally reversed over it, then accidentally put a 120 mil round into a civilian housing complex. And after this unfortunate uh, training accident, you didn't see any more videos from this particular channel. Um, wanting to avoid that, let me start up front. Um, I'm not going to advocate scrapping all the tanks. If you're here for a video that you can share around the internet going, here, this guy said we should get rid of all the tanks, unfortunately, uh, I can't give it to you. Replacing mobile armoured direct fire yeah, um, assets, that role that the tank plays, is something for experts in their employment and use. I have studied their historical use and evaluated their historical use, but when it comes to the modern deployment and use of this problem going forward, you probably need to bring in armoured experts. Um, the requirement itch that they answer is something that the army uh, and armies around the world continuously feel like they need to scratch. I'm not sure anyone has convincingly come up with a way to provide this sort of fire asset to get an army moving, particularly on the offensive. Um, and it's beyond the analyst scope to declare you should you, you can use other tools for that. That was something that would require testing, development. Um, there is plenty of room, I think, for new thinking and techniques in terms of providing the infantry, the, the direct armoured survivable fires that they need in order to advance and manoeuvre. Um, and we can acknowledge that there are serious, serious challenges for the tank. I'm going to be focusing on the, the bang for your buck issues that favour ATGMs um, and missiles over the armour, but I'm not going to say we should get rid of the entire So now that I've preserved my own life, what are we going to be covering? I'm going to give a bit of a background to the ATGM threat and how it's evolved over time. I'm going to talk about what we're seeing in Ukraine and the challenges of interpreting what we're seeing in Ukraine. That all said, we're going to talk about what we do know, what we can reasonably conclude based on what we've seen to, to date. And then because it's one of my videos, we're going to go into the dollars and cents, the investment decisions, the cost benefit analysis um, of these respective weapon systems and what, what it means for the future going forward. Um, that's both in terms of acquisition costs and also accessibility, how easy it is for countries to ramp up access to these systems. We're then going to close out with um, some predictions for the future or some comments on the future, the future of both the missiles and, of course, on the tanks. The first thing to say about the missiles themselves is this is not something new. Um, the memes may be new, the St. Javelin memes may be new, the NLAW itself as a system may be relatively new, but unguided anti-tank rockets were a feature in World War II, with bazookas and Panzerfausts and Panzerschrecks and things like that. You had manual control line of sight systems uh, developed in the 1950s and 60s. Um, you had uh, weapons based on German World War II experimentation coming out in the early 1950s. Um, and they these missile systems were partly enabled uh, a change in NATO doctrine in Europe. Um, as the Western forces started to look for a way to stop Russian tank thrusts that wasn't just nuking the shit out of everything, um, the anti-tank guided missiles seemed to provide one asset that would enable the infantry to do so. So it's not a new threat. Um, but here's a quote for you, as with a picture of a burning tank in the background. On today's battlefield, unsupported tank attacks face mass destruction from accurate and lethal anti-tank guided missiles. And I think surely you would all agree that accurately encapsulates the change in capabilities of ATGMs between like the 1950s and now. Except there's a problem. That quote's from a 1975 um, United States Army Training and Doctrine Command bulletin complete with uh, some fine, fine um, sketch art, um, which is what you'd probably expect a, a student uh, at school scribbling away in their notebook to come up with um, 
Yeah, the, uh, the the quality of art in these bulletins is not always top notch, but you know it is ultimately entertaining. So my point is basically this is not a new phenomenon. Um, Israeli armor in the Yom Kippur War suffered grievously at the hands of these very early Malyutka um, ATGMs that I showed a picture of earlier. Um, so. The ATGM is not something new. These are long-term foes that have evolved together. Longer, they've existed alongside each other for more than most of us uh, watching this video, if Google um, YouTube Analytics is not lying to me, have been on this planet. Um, the ATGM has evolved. It's gotten longer range. It's become lighter in some cases, much easier to, much more accurate, easier to operate um, than these old manual guidance systems. Um, but so is the tank. You have to remember at the time the, the Malyutka, uh, skiff, I think is the, the NATO reporting term that a lot of um, Westerners listening would be more familiar with. Um, when that was around, it was the era of T-55. It was the era of the first generation and second generation of post-war tanks. Um, now, yes, Javelin, Enlaw and whatnot are around, but the tank has evolved significantly too. Um, ATGMs have gotten better at reaching out and touching, but the tank has gotten much better sensors, situational awareness, survival. We're starting to see the emergence of active protection systems, which is where you have um, a tank mounting a system which is designed to intercept and destroy or disrupt incoming missile fire. So the tank has hardly stood still. These are long-term foes. That said, in this constant arms race between the anti-tank weapon and the tank, there's been some very recent and very high profile successes for the anti-armor side of the equation. Tanks have, in short, had a really bad time of it lately, in both PR and in terms of actual losses. Uh, we've seen the Syrian civil war, um, which has been a really bad time for tanks sometimes. Now, part of that is because it's older armor, part of that is because of doctrine issues, part of that is because of combined arms is difficult, part of that is because a lot of the Syrian fighting has been urban in nature, and urban environments have always been kryptonite for armored vehicles. Um, the fact is having a gun that can reach out multiple kilometers and sensors that allow you to acquire at that distance isn't much use when a guy on the fourth story of an apartment building 50 meters away can lean out and put an RPG through the top of your turret. Um, there was the issue of Turkey deploying their leopards on their borders and getting a lot of them unfortunately smacked. And I've even included a turret launch example here to prove that sometimes Western tanks do it too. Um, now, yes, these, these leopards were arguably poorly used, exposed, not properly supported by infantry, but a number of them were destroyed by ATGMs. Um, and now we've got Russian armor, uh, the feared Russian tank force, with enormous armored losses and popular blame falling on anti-tank guided missiles and shoulder-fired weapons. So we shouldn't be too harsh. We shouldn't basically point at the tanks and go, ha ha, you're helpless. But at the same time, we shouldn't fall victim to the advocacy of those who want us to basically look for an excuse and write all of these off. Um, write off the Syrian example because of the terrain, write off the Turkish uh, example because of poor tactics or employment. Um, you can come up with an excuse for almost every situation, but when a pattern emerges, a pattern emerges. And the pattern is, it seems like ATGMs are pretty good at killing most tanks, um, unless you're really, really on top of how they're being employed. So what are we seeing in Ukraine itself? Well, this is seemingly an open and shut case. Um, Russian can visually confirmed armored losses uh, when I took that photo were 284. Uh, that basically means that Russia has lost so many tanks that it would have wiped out the entire, for example, French tank force would be gone. Uh, the German army tank force would cease to exist. Uh, the Australian Army tank force would cease to exist multiple times over. Uh, it's a lot of tanks to lose. Ukrainians are also losing tanks at a, at a significant rate, but it's significantly slower than the visually confirmed Russian losses are coming in. And I've talked about the weakness of using visually confirmed loss numbers before. I'm using them here as a flaw. Russia has lost at least 284 tanks because we have visual proof of 284 tank losses. Coupled with that the fact with uh, every man and his dog in Ukraine seems to have an end law or a javelin or whatnot, they're not just issuing these to regular military. We're seeing uh, territorial defense forces and even irregulars with barely any military uniform um, except for their identifying armbands and flags rolling out there with some of the latest anti-tank equipment out there. They're, they have so much of this equipment being pushed across the border that we're seeing it issued 
on the combat fronts, even to second line and irregular units. So the question raises, okay, we have huge Russian tank losses, we have pictures of anti-tank missiles everywhere, can we conclude that the ATGMs have finally taken the armor crew out behind the barn and shot it? There's evidence here, but let's talk about why it's particularly flawed. Because in terms of deciding what is killing the Russian tanks, uh, things get a little bit complicated. And I'm going to illustrate this with a point. The, the first inclination most people have is to go to video evidence. But if you take a sample, and I did, I took a sample of the first 50 videos I could find of Russian tanks being destroyed. Um, some of them were really low quality, I discarded them. I think I ended up with a sample of 30 that you could interpret. Um, and if you look at those those 30, you'd, you'd decide that the Stugna P um, is the, the king of ATGMs, absolute king of ATGMs. Sorry, it's the Stugna that's the skiff. Um, anyway, um, now this is a Ukrainian built modernized um, ATGM. So if you look at just the visual evidence and you don't apply any analytics on top of it, you'd come up with the conclusion that this is actually the best anti-tank missions missile system in Ukraine and it's what's killing all the Russian tanks. The problem is there's some extraneous factors that are probably driving why this is the only this is the best video we're seeing. Um, the thing with the Stugna is one, you have a video display which is very easy to film and shows the intercept and shows the kill. Um, you need to be using this video display because you need to hold that pepper on the target to guide that missile in until it impacts. Um, and third, you've got a diff distance between the unit that the person is controlling and the launcher itself. You compare this to something like an NLAW where a person locks it, fires it, and then not only do they not have any sort of built-in video system that they can easily film, they can probably hoof it. So with the Stugna, you have to film the strike, it's easy to film the strike, and it's relatively safe to film the strike. With something like a Javelin or an Enlaw, it's hard to film the strike, there's no camera, there's no screen, um, and also once you let that missile go, you're probably going to choose running um, and preserving your life over, say, throwing your cell phone up in the air and filming the strike. So you have to take, that's just one of many factors that might skew the lost data that we're seeing or the video evidence we're seeing of intercepts. We do have lots of videos of tanks and armored vehicles being struck by ATGMs, but we need to caveat around why or why not we wouldn't have that data. We don't have, out of this conflict, a, a complete neat loss table with critical data on all sides. Um, you're spoilt if you study the Second World War, for example, because of the sheer amount of evidence available on cause of loss for just about every armored vehicle that was lost, particularly by the Western Allies, um, and also extensive studies uh, into the loss of German armor, for example. Um, so we don't have that here. We have evidence that all the supplied anti-tank weapons seem to be in play. We see them being issued, we see them being used. Um, but so what? Just because they're being used doesn't mean we have 100% confidence that they're effortlessly slaughtering Russian vehicles. There are other problems with, vid with video evidence. Um, the circumstances in which the video is taken tends to skew things. If you're filming it, um, then you need to be comfortable enough to film it. If you're filming the loss afterwards, these close-ups, these visual confirmations of Russian tanks, that really only happens if you control the ground in the immediate aftermath of the battle. If you're firing a missile and then running, you're not going to get visual evidence. Um, editing can be deceptive. Um, that's a key point. I've seen multiple cuts of the same engagements cut in different ways, in often either in pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian uh, methodology. Um, a failed ambush can be turned into a successful ambush, can be turned into no engagement at all with a little bit of creative editing. This is important because I've talked about how visual evidence is really helpful um, in determining flaws of loss rates, but in terms of identifying what's killing these tanks, uh, it's a little more difficult and you need to use your information appropriately if you're not going to lapse into the field of propaganda. Um, indeed, if we look at video and visual evidence only, um, the biggest tank killer in Ukraine is probably mud. Mud and abandoned by the crew. Abandoned is the single most significant cause of loss for Russian armor. Um, and a lot of the stuff that's abandoned or captured is being shown stuck in the Rapostista in the, in the mud season. So you need to put some thought into this. You can't really put mud in a rocket and cause of kill is something that's difficult to assess. So, the other question I have to raise out of the videos we have to date is that most of the Russian armor we're seeing destroyed seems, does admittedly seem to lack some of the most modern features that you would expect to neutralize ATGMs. 
Um, I'm not seeing evidence of wide fitting of the most modern Russian um, active protection systems. No Drozd on like that T80 prototype doesn't count. That's a like late Cold War system, which doesn't hold a candle to the more modern protection systems that we know exist. Uh, trophy is one example. So we have to question our evidence a little bit. I know I've ha harped on that a lot. Let's just put that to one side now and say, well, what can we say in terms of our evidence for these shoulder fire weapons being really effective? The first is, with all those caveats, we do have qualified visual evidence of these things working. Um, we have visual evidence, usually from drones, but also sometimes from operators, of anti-tank guided missiles striking vehicles, sometimes striking vehicles that are visually fitted with the ERA plates, for example. We don't know if that ERA is, you know, full of cardboard boxes or is the actual thing, but we can see ERA plates fitted. Might be contact five, might be relic, depends on the vehicle. Um, it might be contact one or it might be egg cartons. Either way, we see the ATGM striking vehicles, we see the vehicles brewing up or being destroyed. Uh, we have reporting from both sides of losses. Both sides admit some losses, both sides claim other losses, and with that you can sort of triangulate the efficacy of these weapon systems. We also know what the Ukrainians are asking for, and they're asking for an awful lot of these anti-armor weapon systems. They were some of the first things that they requested, um, and they're now some of the things that they're requesting in ever greater quantities. Now, in part, this might be just because they know they can't get other systems quickly. Maybe, let's just say hypothetically, tanks were still the best weapons to kill other tanks. Well, getting tanks across the Polish-Ukrainian border at short notice and getting Ukrainians uh, trained and crewed on them is not as practical as getting the weapon systems in, um, in the form of shoulder launch missiles that don't take much training. That said, they're asking for them, they're getting them, they're using them, so we can imply some degree of efficacy. Over that, we can overlay the high level of general Russian losses, the slow state of the offensive, and suggest that maybe these weapons are at least giving the Russians pause. Technical data has some value. People love penetration tables. People love technical data spec sheets. Um, I think these can be overblown, but we also have to admit that the armor penetration data on all of these weapons does suggest that if they get a good clean strike on most tanks, and especially if they get a good clean strike on the top or the sides or the rear, uh, they have all the destructive potential needed in order to burst through ERA, for example, and neutralize a tank. So what can we reasonably conclude based on all of those? Um, we can reasonably conclude that modern ATGMs can, at the very least, kill tanks up to including the modernized T-72s, T-80s that we've seen. Um, we know that they can be shipped and trained very, very quickly. I'd add to that previous list, by the way, things like the, the Turkish version of the Leopard. And if you base on technical data sheets, basically everything up to and including the most modern upgrade packages of most Western MDTs, as long as it's not a direct strike in the frontal quarter. We know that these missiles can be shipped and trained on very, very quickly. There's a very short gap between missile systems that weren't present in U and, and rocket systems that weren't present in Ukraine before the invasion started and then appearing in the hands of the, uh, the TDF. When Spain ships shoulder-fired unguided anti-tank rockets that weren't in Ukraine before and you see them with the Turkish, uh, not the Turkish, Territorial Defense Forces um, less than a week or so later, that means that the shipping and training process can be done very, very quickly. We know that soft vehicles stand no bloody chance, or softer vehicles, so BMPs, um, Kamas, trucks, um, all those support, anything that isn't a tank is going to be made an absolute mockery of by most of these ATGM and unguided shoulder-fired systems. Um, and we know the Russians are worried enough about this to roll out specific countermeasures for them. We've seen these cages over the T-72s. Uh, people call them cope cages. Uh, they seem to be intended to, as spaced armor, to detonate projectiles that are doing a top attack profile. We're not sure exactly if they work. We just know we've seen out a lot of destroyed tanks with those cages. Um, but I haven't seen evidence of visual damage to those cages, i.e. warheads top attacking and punching through them. Um, something else may have destroyed them. It may just be they were hit in direct attack mode instead. Um, Either way, it seems like there's a lot of uh, bloody problems for the armor out there. Yes, I've qualified a lot of these points, but it's still problematic. I've got from that same 1975 bulletin up there, the old rock, paper, scissors. Um, anytime someone says war is not a simple game, I, uh, show them this ostensible rock, paper, scissors diagram. Um, and the idea here is tanks counter infantry, infantry counter anti-tank um, teams, and anti-tank teams with their anti-tank vehicles knock out tanks. Um, 
I've quite jokingly said that the new relationship is something to be that the infantry kills the tanks, the artillery, guided by the drones, bombards the tanks, the mud immobilizes the tanks, and then after all is said and done, the John Deere tractors come along and steal them. It's a bit joking, but it is true that it does seem that the tanks are having a little bit of a bad time. And the speed of adoption, I want to come back to this, has been incredible. We've seen tens of thousands of shoulder-fired weapons being pushed in a matter of weeks. Um, this has been coupled with the Ukrainians declaring very rapid ammunition depletion and constantly asking for more. My side point here is, why do we always seem to be surprised by how quickly forces run through ammunition in a conventional conflict? Um, this was a point, when, when Tom Clancy wrote Red Storm Rising, uh, he predicted, as, as a fiction writer, far higher ammunition uh, consumption rates than were being assumed at the time. Um, those ended up being borne out in later conflicts, and we still continue to be surprised by how much ordnance um, armies can expand in a shorter period of time. Um, armies at war eat ammo. They eat missiles um, really, really quickly. Uh, recently, Ukraine's requested, I think, 500 uh, missiles a day just on the Javelin system. Um, but the thing is here, if you've got the inventory, you can ship them. A cargo aircraft can carry dozens or hundreds of these systems, closer to hundreds. Uh, troops can be trained on them quickly. They can be trucked to the front, or in some cases in Ukraine, we've seen basically you militarize civilian vehicles and you drive around with them in your boot. So you can move these systems a lot more quickly than, say, shipping heavy armor to reinforce a front. So the first lesson I'd say that we know for sure is the pace of use. The Ukrainians say they're depleting their, their stocks really, really quickly. We have lots and lots of video evidence of them being fired. Uh, it stands to reason that we can be moderately confident that they are using these missiles very, very quickly. The second lesson is that you can ramp, them, ramp up their use very, very quickly. You can get a bunch of reservists and irregulars, so increase the, the size of your force very quickly. You can give them these weapons, train them on them very quickly, put them in a defensive position, and then suddenly you have anti-tank assets. Uh, you compare this to the time it would take to train a new tank crew and get a tank operational from the reserve, especially if you don't have a pre-trained reservist tank crew. Um, it's much, much, much quicker to develop an anti-armor capability by giving, um, by giving Ivan a rocket and putting him in a trench or telling him to go out at night with that rocket and go find a convoy and put a rocket into it. The third lesson is that these things can be lethal. We know at the very least, and we have evidence to suggest that you can kill tanks with these. How well you can kill tanks with these, how easily you can kill tanks with these, that's still open That's still open for study in the post-war era. It's always open for study in the post-war era when you have better data. But for now, we can conclude at the very least that under some circumstances, they, they seem to work. And this leads into the dollars and cents point because if the web, just like I said with the drones video, you don't have to know that this thing works every time in order for the economics to make it a preferred weapon system. There's no avoiding the cost differential here. The end law is like a $40,000 system. Javelin depends on whether you're buying a fresh launcher with the, with the clue and the missile at export rates or whether you're the USDOD buying replacement missiles. But think $80,000 to 175000 bucks whenever you fire one of these off. You couple this with hit rate data. Uh, I've seen sources from the West claiming as high as hit rates of 90% on the Javelin system. But again, Western sources. Uh, and the cost to kill comes way, way, way down. You're talking about killing a multi-million dollar tank with a crew uh, which required training and support and a long logistics tail, and you're talking about killing it with one or two guys using a weapon system that costs uh, a tenth or a fiftieth or a hundredth of the total cost of the system that they're destroying. At those sort of rates, killing a truck loaded with ammo is worth it, let alone killing a tank and its crew. Um, and in objection, I've sometimes heard people point out, well, Yes, mo like modern tanks are expensive, are multi-million dollar behemoths, but you can get T-55s or old T-72s for like $500,000. And at that point, like, ha ha, I can get an old T-55 even cheaper than a Javelin in Extremis. But that doesn't really make this problem better because the old tank A is absolutely going to get destroyed by that ATGM. It probably has no situational awareness. It's still carrying a crew of three or four, so you're still getting people killed in a vehicle that has none of the sensor capabilities, none of the communications capabilities, crap all protection and limited battlefield utility, that still sucks up fuel from the long line of fuel trucks that need to support its production. So no, cheap tanks don't solve this problem. 
The other point uh, to say around here is in terms of cost is that production can ramp and weapons can be stored. That is, you can pick up production of these things much more quickly than you can pick up production of, say, full main battle tanks. And, and the weapons can be stored easily. They take up a lot less space um, and they can be shipped far more easily. You don't need a long logistics chain. A light infantry force using ATGMs does not need a, need a long 40 long, 40 mile long convoy of fuel trucks, uh, fuel and ammunition trucks to keep it going. It just needs um, the, the food for the infantrymen uh, and the constant supply of replacement weapon systems. The next point is accessibility, both in production and in training use. Uh, Ukraine, for example, can produce its own ATGMs. Now, Ukraine is a, potentially a bad example here because it can also produce its own tanks and tank upgrade packages. Um, but it is a large producer of ATGMs. They're just in a real hurry right now, which is why the focus on getting as many Western systems as, as possible. Plus, some of those Western systems have advantages um, over the systems that the Ukrainians themselves are producing. Training requirement, we said this several times, so we won't harp on it, is lower, which means you can give them to reservists, you can give them to irregular warfighters, um, and you have an anti-armor asset and system accessible and producible early. If you are a country with a small defense sector, and you can't, for example, reliably build your own main battle tanks, and most countries cannot build their own main battle tanks, you can probably build these things. So much like the drone v aircraft debate, you can't build advanced fast jets, but you can probably build cheap drones. You might not be able to build tanks, but you can definitely build these things if you have a little bit of an electronic sector and some precision manufacturing capability. And it's a huge step change from giving Irregulars what you would previously give them, which might be something like the RPG-7, uh, an old-fashioned, unguided, shoulder-fired rocket, which, yes, has anti-armor capability. Um, it's a huge step change to give the guy an end law instead. And it's also worth remembering that not every target is a tank. This is a bit of an aside in a, in a video about whether or not tanks are going the, the way of the dodo. Um, but tanks are not the only target for this ordinance. There's a lot of um, APCs being destroyed, of IFEs being destroyed, a lot of trucks, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of trucks being destroyed. And against lighter targets, SPGs, APCs, IFEs, um, these weapon systems which might struggle against, say, the frontal armor of the most modern MBTs out there, um, are going to make an absolute mincemeat of them. And the tanks without all their support vehicles, the tanks without their mechanized infantry, the tanks without their fuel trucks, the tanks without ammo resupply, are just vulnerable. So this is a weapon system that provides a mechanism to give ordinary infantry a chance to destroy these targets too. It's a reliable means to generate value. $40,000 rocket equals you know, a, a fraction, a decimal of a destroyed vehicle because you have to account for misses and fails. So what's the way forward for ATGMs based on what we're seeing? Well, first of all, I'll say it's a really good time to own shares in companies that produce these things because they're getting fantastic advertisements. We're sort of seeing a modern uh, rendition of tiger terror in a sense, where every time a missile's being used or a tank is destroyed in Ukraine, it seems like parts of the media want to say it was destroyed by a javelin. Um, Stugna is a javelin. Enlor is a javelin. Uh, all these unguided rocket systems that are coming in from uh, Spain and elsewhere, they're, they're all javelin. In fact, every Every Russian tank destroyed has been by Javelin. It's a, it's a bit of a modern tiger terror phenomenon where every in World War II where every German tank was suddenly a tiger because people were scared of it and people knew the name. Good thing if you're in the business of manufacturing Javelins, I think. The second point is that these are going to become a really attractive tool. They already were, but even more so for powers that are likely to be on the defensive, so situations where you don't really need as much the mobile protective fire element that a tank provides, and the biggest priority is instead killing the other side's tank to deny them momentum. So if you're likely to be on the defense, if you have forests, if you have hard terrain, if you have good light infantry, if you have a major power opponent who's likely to roll their tanks in on you and you don't think you can match them tank for tank, this is going to be an increasingly attractive weapon system. Uh, the way forward, they're industrial accessible, so see more countries break into their manufacture um, or license their manufacture at home. They're obviously concealable, they'll stay concealable. They're practical to store. I basically foresee good times ahead for the ATGM market. However, it needs that nice way forward needs to be grounded in the understanding of how many systems are realistically required to see off a conventional push. If your opponent has thousands of tanks, we should take the ammunition consumption data from Ukraine as it starts to crystallize and perhaps warn us that having, say, 200 javelins in inventory 
probably isn't enough. They're not gonna be where you need to be. You're gonna lose some of them, some will fail, some of them will miss, some of them will be used on subpar targets. You probably need a lot more of these things in order to deter an opponent than you might initially think. And then what about the poor tanks? Because I started with this by saying, hey, we're not gonna scrap them all. And then I basically spent the rest of the presentation talking about why ATGMs are awesome and the tanks are having a really bad time. Well, we can't get rid of the armor, but we have to acknowledge the issue. Um, getting rid of the tanks doesn't really solve the problem because you leave a giant doctrinal hole. But you have to accept their immense costs from crew to the logistics chain. One of the biggest problems the Russians are facing in Ukraine is logistics. And tanks make logistics problems really, really bad because by God, do they suck fuel. Um, especially when you're talking about like gas turbine engines, so the T-80 series, the M1A2, um, they suck a lot of gas. Um, we also need to be realistic when we're talking about getting rid of tanks or the future of tanks about tank fleet sizes. We have seen, as I've said before, Russia lose enough tanks to basically completely eliminate some of the MBT fleets that we would have seen in Western Europe. The Ukrainian losses would, neuter, would completely neuter a lot of the tank forces we see out there. So we need to also be realistic about our numbers of tanks. Unless you're sure your tanks are super, super, super survivable, um, if you're relying on them to give you momentum in an offensive operation, for example, you need to be more realistic about how many of them you're likely to need if losses are likely to be the case. The tank probably does need to evolve and there are questions over the direction that evolution can take. My side note here is why do we always beat up on tanks? Like everyone wants to know about the future of tanks or if they're going the way of the dodo. Um, we're seeing helicopters have real problems against modern man pads in Ukraine too, which is a separate topic I know, but um, the helicopter crews never seem to get beaten up quite as much as the tank crews are. Anyway, there's a couple of options, as I said, for evolving. And this is now me just giving a bit of an overview rather than saying which way the system should go. Um, option one is you bling it up. You keep modernizing the tank and you try and win the arms race, the back and forth between ATG, between missiles and the tank survivability. So you up armor the front of the thing at the very least so it can survive frontal hits. You rely increasingly on active protection systems. You give the thing better sensors. You network it with drones and you bling the tank up to the point where it can probably realistically survive more of these threats. There's room for serious evolution in design thinking. Um, the issue with this approach becomes cost. R&D on the vehicle, acquisition and sustainment on the system, how heavy is the vehicle getting, how expensive is the vehicle getting, and how well trained do you need your crew to be in order to make the best use of all of these systems. Um, the question of drill, for example, becomes, if I say the words SAGA drill, um, a lot of the old armor guys in the chat are probably going to know exactly what I mean and it might bring back memories for them. It's about training to counter ATGMs as well, coupled with upgrades to the vehicle. Option two is you, you stop even trying to, to survive these incoming weapon systems and you rely on mobility, not getting hit, coupled probably with an active protection system. This is you move more to mobile gun systems, uh, things that aren't tanks, that are lighter, more maneuverable, perhaps more concealable. Um, and instead of relying on heavy armor to survive a hit, you just accept that, look, if you're getting hit, if your active protection system and your concealment and your cover fails, well, too bad, so sad. So maybe mobile fire is acceptable over the cost and you can strike out survivable. Um, there are open questions here on what the options are to replace the tank's role, particularly on the offensive. Again, I leave this to the tank doctrine guys um, rather than someone with more of a historical context um, and an industrial and economically minded one. The other point of evolution is that it might not even be about the tank at all. This is an old story, but we're coming back to it. Situational awareness, combined arms have long been a feature of survivable and effective tank forces. In World War II, um, tanks without support of infantry would always, <laughs> or at least often, get decimated by things as simple as, in the late war, guys with Panzerfaust with ranges of 80 or 100 meters, uh, concealed anti-tank gun positions, um, the Turkish Leopards without proper infantry and combined arms support got slaughtered by ATGMs. Tanks without proper supporting dismounts, without proper supporting other arms, have always been prone to being completely murdered. So maybe the, um, the way forward is just to invest more money in training, in sensors. So network drone systems, network sensors, really good cooperation with infantry dismounts um, in order to make sure that you've got the proper combined arm systems in place in order to help neutralize defending ATGMs, limit that threat and, and have the whole system work correctly. So it might not be a case of buying huge amounts of new equipment. 
um, although there might be some of that, it might be investing really heavily in training troop quality and getting that, that doctrine, but also the ability to execute on that doctrine right in order to improve the survivability of the tanks. We haven't seen evidence that the Russians are being particularly effective with their, their combined arm systems. We're seeing an awful lot of tanks being ambushed on roads um, with limited infantry support. We've seen some cases of infantry support, but we've also seen isolated armor being destroyed separate to any supporting arms. The other thing I'll say here though, is that even if there is a way forward for the tank, that's not really an answer to ATGMs and shoulder fired ordnance in general, because the world is full of legacy systems. Most opponents are not going to roll out nothing but the newest technology with elite troops trained in combined arms warfare who are capable of effectively neutralizing light infantry defending with anti-tank guided missiles. Nations that expend resources maintaining and deploying technology that is a little bit older, that's a little bit um, more vulnerable, are expending resources on a system that can be cost-effectively countered. Um, what that means is that there is scope, just as there is with drones to be an asymmetric mechanism for smaller nations to catch up. Uh, a nation which is not maintaining a large amount of legacy systems that is threatened by one that is, may have an opportunity to significantly narrow the gap in defense capability while having a smaller budget if they invest instead of trying to match them tank to tank with buying counters that you know are gonna um, make a mockery of those older legacy vehicles. It also means that while I'm not advocating scrapping all tanks, my eyes are squarely focused on the legacy systems that have really questionable survivability on the modern battlefield. Um, if your tank is really, really old and is going to get destroyed, there is no questions about it, by modern anti-tank weapon systems, do you really want to be maintaining the logistics, the training, and the maintenance schedules needed to keep that system in service? I've heard the phrase again and again and again in reference to the T-55, for example, that bad tank better than no tank. I'm not sure that's always the case. From an, as, as a spreadsheet warrior, from an economic standpoint, are we sure that's always the case? Because the bad tank requires fuel trucks, the bad tank requires crew, the bad tank requires spare parts and maintenance, and the side that isn't spending money on the bad tank might instead have bought 20 or 30 or 40 weapons capable of destroying that bad tank and then has 38 left over or they have spare money in the kitty for some other defense capability. I'm not convinced that legacy systems in modern conventional conflicts have much of a role. Um, they're just too vulnerable, while at the same time having most of the logistics costs associated with them that the most modern and more survivable systems have. T-14 sucks gas, so does a T-55. I'd rather have a T-14 or an M1A2 set V3. If your goal is to dissuade a stronger opponent right now, your way to do it cost effectively if you're on the defense and you want to deny them offensive momentum, as long as people rely on tanks to get offensives moving, investment in anti-tank guided missiles and shoulder fired weapons seems to be a, a seriously convincing way to go. So one of my key takeaways, the Ukraine-Russia war is the latest to prove a point, uh, an obvious point, but a point nonetheless. Anti-tank guided missiles, being anti-tank missiles, can kill tanks. This is not a new fact. Historically, forces get punished whenever their combine arm breaks down, and anti-tank weapons throughout history have generally been pretty damn good at killing tanks, and the modern era is no exception. Um, the other issue we've identified to take away from Ukraine is that tanks without fuel and spares are at a significant disadvantage. Remember, a significant share of Russian tanks being lost in Ukraine are not being killed. They're being abandoned by their crews, often out of fuel. So the logistics trains of armor remain more vulnerable in many cases than the armor itself. We focused on weapons killing tanks, but if you can kill the logistics chain, the tank doesn't have particularly many options. And as a platform that is so fuel and ammo hungry, they're particularly vulnerable to this problem. Another key takeaway is that these missiles have an irrefutable cost advantage over their targets. They provide efficient combat power, particularly in certain scenarios. And for to Ukraine's advantage, those certain scenarios include a scenario where the defending power has lots of available light infantry and is on the defense against a force that's relying armor to gain the momentum, but doesn't have, for example, air superiority or the other tools it needs in order to help neutralize that defensing ATGM threat. Um, there's no close cooperating, or it's hard for the Russians to be using close cooperation with helicopters or air support when they don't dominate the skies yet. Next takeaway is no, the spreadsheet warriors of the world are not gonna make the army get rid of all the tanks. Um, no matter how 
much the numbers stack up against them, until you can fill the doctrinal hole and until the army says they don't need them, we're going to continue funding them. The doctrine guys will tell the defense appropriation guys and the defense planning guys what they need going forward, even if that comes with a price tag. And nations that want to maintain that capability will continue to spend on it, um, but they probably need to spend on it in a way that provides systems that are survivable and use useful on the battlefield that now features a proliferating number of very capable shoulder-fired systems, shoulder-fired and non-shoulder-fired systems. But if you're on a budget, and this is the final takeaway, I think the most endangered thing are the really old legacy tanks, particularly nations that will be on the defensive with large legacy tank fleets. I think they're the ones that are really in the crosshairs. Uh, tanks that are super vulnerable to these systems at the same time when you can still plow your resources into more and more of these anti-tank systems in order to deny your opponent, your more powerful opponent, his offensive momentum, his offensive assets. Um, and there's a real question over whether those systems, those old tank systems, increasingly go extinct in countries that don't have infinite defense budgets in favor of more uh, expenditure on other anti-tank options and assets and other fire options on the defense that are not tanks. I hope that was all useful. I hope that was relatively fair-minded. I know that there was probably a lot of people on this video hoping I went in the direction of saying the tanks are hopelessly obsolete. Um, to all the tankers in the chat and former tankers, I hope this has come off as relatively fair-minded. Your systems are expensive. They are difficult to sustain and maintain. We accept that they fill a, a doctrinal or tactical requirement that it's hard to replace, but hopefully the contention that the systems are vulnerable are expensive, that they require really good combined arms, which is expensive and requires good training, and also that legacy tanks are just extremely vulnerable in general will be relatively uncontroversial. We will learn more about this ongoing battle between the tank and the anti-tank as this conflict goes on, as this war goes on and we get better data. But for now, these are the conclusions I feel I can support. Ukraine, as long as it continues to be supplied with anti-tank weapons, as long as we don't see a massive step change in the combined arms performance of the Russian forces to date, it is fair to say that Ukrainian infantry will continue to retain the ability to defend themselves against Russian armor. And as long as that's the case, um, major sweeping penetrating Russian offensives have a giant question mark over them um, based on the evidence we've seen to date. Now, final closeout on an update on the, the channel and what's to come. If you're only interested in the video, you can drop off here. Um, for those of you who are wondering what's happening next, this was uh, this is the penultimate in the planned series of uh, topics I'm going to do on lessons from the Russia-Ukraine war to date that people voted on in a poll earlier. The final one is on reservists and irregulars and the role that they have played. Um, after that video is done, there will be a pause as I consider whether I make more topics on either this conflict or other uh, topics of interest from a military industrial perspective. Um, I have a limited number of topics where I feel I've got something to contribute and I don't want to start branching out beyond that, um, but I'll really rely on the reception these videos are getting to decide whether or not I do that. There's also an open question over whether or not the channel gets split at some point, whether gaming and contemporary topics continue to coexist or whether or not I'm required to split this channel. But again, that's a decision I'm going to make after the Russia-Ukraine series is finished. The final point is I have been told that even if I turn monetization off, YouTube and Google still show ads on videos. What I am attempting to do with this one is I have thus turned it on and then turned the ads to the least obnoxious settings that I can think of, um, disabling all ones that run during the middle of the video, disabling unskippables, all the stuff that I hate. Um, I've turned all that off. Um, so hopefully that so partially solves the problem. I'm assuming they won't ignore my instructions and still run ads anyway, but if you are getting really obnoxious ads in the middle of the video, please tell me. Um, this whole YouTube ad thing is pretty new to me. I've never run ads before, um, but I also didn't know they were being run on my own video, so there you go. Um, thanks for the tremendous response to all of this. I hope these videos have been useful and that you're looking forward to the next one. I read and engage, I read all the comments. I apologize for the fact I don't have time to engage with them all. I'd rather focus on preparing the next bit of content rather than engaging with every point. But thank you again for the comments and engagements to date, and I'll see you again soon.